On today's episode, my guest is Rabbi Shays Taub. We had so much fun unpacking big questions like what is the soul, where do we go after this life, what are we really doing while we're here. Uh, but we also take it into really practical areas because Rabbi Taub is actually a psychological expert who has a very widely followed advice column in Ami magazine. His advice can you know, vary from the esoteric to the ultra-practical in one second and flip right back. And he's got an amazing sense of humor. Let's have some fun with Rabbi Shay's Tao. Accidental tumble, just wisdom you don't want to miss. Now my pal Sal, take it away. Welcome to the Accidental Talmudist podcast. I'm very pleased to welcome Rabbi Shays Taub today. How are you? Baruch Hashem, thank God, doing well. Good to be with you, Sal. You've, uh, I just picked you up uh, at the place where you were staying uh, in West Hollywood. You flew in last night from? Straight from uh, JFK, from New York. From the Holy Land. Now, it's nice to fly in and out of JFK because you can always make that stop by the Ahel, by the, the Rebbe's grave. Do you do that? You know, yes, but now I live in the Five Towns, which is just over the border between Queens and Nassau County, which means right turn on red. And I'm about 15 minutes from the OL, and I'm there multiple times a week. It used to be that I would, when I didn't live in New York, I would come in, go to the OL, and sometimes that would be my only visit to New York. In fact, I remember one time I was there, it was about three in the morning. It's always interesting at the Ohel, very, very late at night to see the traffic, to see people, you know, coming in. I remember one time I was there at three in the morning and somebody had come straight from JFK uh, and came in, came out. I don't want to give too many identifying details, but it was a couple that flew in from another continent and they had just landed and they came straight to the Ohel. They had asked for a blessing for a, a child, and it had come to fruition, and they basically flew from many hours. It's about a 10-hour flight away. And they came to the Ohel. It's like 15 minutes from JFK. And they went in. They said their thanks, and then said, we're, now we're going back to JFK to get the morning flight. Wow. Back home. <laughs> so that was the whole journey. That was, yeah, that was the whole journey. And it's just nice because, you know, human nature is that when we're in need, we cry out. But when we've been answered, sometimes we, we forget to express gratitude. So I thought that was really cool. I would even say usually we forget. That, 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 that is a, one of the darker parts of human nature. Yeah. Now let's clarify uh, for our audience. So Rabbi Taub, you are part of the Chabad. Uh, let's say stream of Judaism. Would you say stream? Yeah, it's a denomination? Stream. Yeah, stream. stream. I like the word stream because it implies movement. It's like living, dynamic. I like that word. Yeah, beautiful. And uh, and you are a very prominent speaker. As we were speaking in the car on the way here, you told me that you, for, it's been a long time, years since you've been a geographically fixed rabbi. You're, you're most. I was ahead of the curve. You know how everything has become because of the internet. Nothing's geographical. Right. I haven't been geographical in. In, in 10 years, at least, yeah. But you've been racking up the miles. Racking up the miles, <laughs> that's right, that's right. Giving the talks. Now, um, now this question, actually, uh, about going and, and praying, giving thanks, giving, getting blessings, etc., at the grave of a tzaddik, at the yeah. grave of a righteous man, like the Rebbe of blessed memory, is very interesting uh, to me, actually, because this coming week, I'm going to Uman for Rosh Hashanah, mm -hmm. Uh, and we'll be saying prayers by the graveside of Rebbe Nachman of Breslov. And just yesterday we were doing a live show in Accidental Talmudist, and I mentioned that, and people said, why do you go pray to a, a dead guy? Don't you pray to God? Right, yeah, what's up with that? What's yeah. up with that? And, and I actually yeah. said, well, no, of course we pray to God. Perhaps our prayers are amplified. Perhaps he helps right. us pray. Perhaps he focuses our prayer. But it's a little confusing. It is confusing, yeah, and it's very important because to pray to anyone other than God, heaven forbid, is not a small issue. Right. Yeah. So, so what are we doing at the graveside of a tzaddik? That's a great question. What are we doing? Oh, you're asking me. I'm asking oh, you. Okay, I'm fine. assuming you're a bigger expert than me. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, uh, 
you know, first of all, before we even talk about the grave site of a tzaddik, but let's just ask a more general question, which is, if we're praying to God and God is everywhere, then what does it matter where you pray? Okay, let's start there. Why, why go to the Western Wall? So uh, there's a story about a little boy who used to disappear every afternoon, and his father couldn't find him for hours. And finally, the father got worried. He decided to follow the boy. And uh, he realized that the child goes into the forest by himself and comes out, comes out hours later. And the father followed him a few times and saw this is what he's doing every day until finally he confronted him. And the father said, what do you do in the forest for hours by yourself every day? And the boy was very embarrassed. And he said, I pray. I talk to God. And the father said, but son, why do you have to go into the forest to talk to God? God is everywhere. God is no different wherever you are. God is the same. God is no different, so why are you going to the forest? And the little boy said, yes, it's true. Wherever I am, God is no different. But when I go to the forest, I am different. So, really, we can pray anywhere. We can pray anywhere on Earth. We can pray at the International Space Station. There's no place where we could go where we couldn't pray to God. But there are places where we are more connected to that part of ourselves with which we pray. Okay. Let me give you another analogy. There's time and there's space. So we're talking about space. Why would you go to a particular space when God is everywhere? Well, let's talk about it in terms of time. We're coming up to the high holidays. Um, why would we say a particular day is more auspicious than another for connecting to God? God is more God on Rosh Hashanah than he is the rest of the year. And yet our sages say, seek out Hashem where he may be found. It's actually, it's uh, one of the uh, verses from the prophet. It's the uh, communal haftorah that we read on a, on a fast day. Hashem search out Hashem where he may be found. And our sages say, what does it mean, search out, where he, search, search out Hashem where he may be found? Hashem is everywhere. He may be found everywhere. And they say, this is Aseris Yimei over the days of awe, the ten days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. So, what does that mean? It can't mean that God is more God during those 10 days, but what it does mean is that I am different. I'm more sensitive. My, uh, you know, it's sort of like when you, when you test the levels on the sound equipment, you know, like on these mics, you try to you find out what the maximum is. You try to hear what it's like then. Now, it doesn't mean we're necessarily going to be pushing that limit the whole time when we're talking, but it's like you, sometimes you find the maximum setting to so know, you what's know what your peak p you know potential, what the peak is. potential is. Right. So there are there are special times and special places where we're at our peak potential. God God doesn't change, but there are times and places where we are at our best. Where we are at our best and where we influence each other, right? Probably we could reach a higher potential on our own, on a desert island, during those 10 days. But the fact that we're surrounded by people who are also trying to elevate and reach their higher potential does affect us. Okay, so that's very interesting. The Sefer Yitzira, which is an early Kabbalistic text, speaks about three dimensions. I had mentioned two, time and space. But there's a third dimension, which is the human dimension. It refers to it with the, with the acronym uh, Oshon, which means smoke. But it's uh, Olam, Olam. You know, with the world. I, yeah, the world. That means space. Okay. Shona, the times, year. The that year. means. Okay. By the way, the word Shona is a very interesting, like, like Rosh Hashanah or Shana Tova. Shona or Shana, same word, different accent. I'm just putting the accent on a different syllable. But, <laughs> The word shana or shana, which means year, is a very interesting word itself. It's a bit of a paradox because um, on one hand, 
It's etymologically related to the word shinui, which means a change, alteration. But it's also related to the word shani, which means twice, repetition. Or like uh, when my Maimonides wrote the Mishnah Torah. Okay. Mishnah also has that, sh that, that same root there. And that means the repetition of the Torah or the reiteration of the Torah. So the word shana has that double meaning, change. And cycling and repeating. And repeating. Right. So if it's changing, it's not repeating. If it's repeating, it's not changing. changing. So which is it? And like a good Jewish paradox, the answer is? Both. Yeah. <laughs> well, how do you do that? With a spiral. Right. Like yeah. a spiral schwindeltrap. That's what we say in Yiddish. Spiral staircase. Okay. Oh, an upward ascending spiral staircase. So we come back to the same. That's how, that's how time works. Every Passover, redemption is in the air, freedom, the potential for, for liberation. And every Rosh Hashanah, the potential for new beginnings and for re rejuvenation is, is in the air, but on a higher level than it's ever been. So Shana, year, time, time itself implies both repetition and growth. Okay, so that's the second dimension. So first we had Olam, which so is space. That's the place. Shana, which is time. Time. And then I told you it's Ayin Shin Nun. The third one is Nefesh. Nefesh means the soul. Okay. And that's the human dimension. So the peak setting would be the most potent place, the most potent time, and the most potent group. Group. Right. Right. And certainly we feel that, for example, on a, on a Shabbos evening at the Western Wall in Jerusalem, that's a peak time, that's a peak place, and everybody's so up peak and charged group. for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then there's the dancing and the singing, and it's powerful, it's palpable. Yeah, that's right. It lifts everybody up. Now, God is not more present, but definitely, subjectively, our experience is a lot more... We are more present to God. We are more present to God, yeah. Now, let's not get off the topic because you're asking about the grave sites exactly. of the righteous. Where do we get this idea from that the grave site of a righteous person is one of those potent places? Now that we've established that there's such a concept as a potent place. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. So where does this practice come from? Where does it originate? The first reference we find in Jewish tradition actually goes all the way back to, to the Torah, to the, the Chomesh, the five books, in the book of Bamidbar, in the book of Numbers, in the Torah portion of Shlach, which happens to be my Bar Mitzvah Parsha, by the way. Um, in the Parsha of Shlach, Moses sends spies, one from each tribe, and um, a disastrous venture. Disastrous, yeah, because they were afraid. It's interesting, by the way. What were they afraid of? Because this this relates to this uh, whole discussion. What were they afraid of? They said the land, meaning the land of Israel, devours its inhabitants. And uh, Chassidus teaches what they meant was having a relationship with the land, with physicality, will devour us. In the wilderness, we are eating bread from heaven, the manna, and we're drinking water from the well of Miriam. Nobody has jobs. It's beautiful. We learn Torah all day we long. We learn Torah all day beneath, long. Beneath the cloud of God that shelters us from the sun. So it's all, it's just like yeshiva. Your parents are paying the bills, <laughs> and you just be spiritual all day, right? Right. Like they say, youth is wasted on the young. Okay. If we go into the land, we're going to have to be grown-ups, and it's going to destroy our spiritual life. Okay. So the, well, they were wrong because Judaism is a religion of action, 613 mitzvot, which are actions. So they completely missed the idea that it's not about um, enlightenment. It's not about your own personal subjective connection. It's about making the world a better place, and you've got to get down and dirty get to work in the world 
yeah. and engage the world. So they missed that. But it's interesting because side point within a side point is that they were... This whole conversation is a hypertext. Yes. Within a hypertext. That's right. That's right. <laughs> the real conversation is one sentence. That's right. That's right. So I think they call it a, a wiki trance, by the way. When you're reading a Wikipedia article and it takes you five hours because you go like... And that's Talmud within, study. Click. That's, that's Talmud it. Study that's how we've well. done it for thousands right. of years. And that's why it can take you, it could take a yeshiva months to learn one page. How does it take months to learn one page? Because, because every word is a window. That's right. Another one. That, yeah, that's beautiful. That's yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. So the the spies. We're going to get them. back to the yeah. the spies, which is going to take us to the first reference in Schlock, which is going to take us to the the great Rest side of the righteous. Of the, of the righteous. Yeah. So ten of the spies come back with ill report. They say we can't do it. No way. Two of the spies came back. With, uh, with a and, and just to set this up for people. So yeah. the, the, the story that we're talking about is the, the children of Israel wandering the desert. Yeah. We've been told we're going to enter the promised land. Yeah. Uh, it is suggested that we send some spies to check out this land that we're going to reside in. Uh, God right. says, okay. And at this point, this is only over a little over a year after the Exodus. Right. We've, we've received There's the no Torah 40 at years Sinai. Yet. There's there, no 40 years. That, that is the sentence that's going to come out of, that's right. of this disaster. That's right. happen event. after that. Yeah. Right. So this is a year, a year and a few months after the Exodus. And we're going in. The question is now not if. The question is how. Yeah. Where will we start? Who will go where? Yeah. So then they come back and then they, they say, nah, eh, forget it. Ten of them. Ten out of the twelve say forget it. So there were two that came back with positive reports. One was Joshua, Yeshua, who was the more than just the student of everyone was the student of Moses. Everyone was Moses' student, but he was his devoted disciple. He was he was his secretary, assistant, prime, yeah. prime minister, yeah. grand vizier. Yeah, right. yeah. His his life was about serving Moses. Yeah. And in fact, when succession, it came down to succession, Moses had two sons. It did not go to his sons. It went to, and it didn't even go to his nephews, Aaron's sons. I mean, they were priests, but succession went to his most devoted disciple, which is a whole other discussion. Because his sons aren't going to listen to dad's lectures. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Billy Joel said that when his daughters from Christy Brinkley were, were teenagers, he said, if I ever wanted to make them behave, if we were in public, I'd threaten to sing. And they'd be mortified. <laughs> they'd be mortified. Oh, no, Dad, don't sing. Of course. Now, of anyone course. else in the world. You Private know, concert you, from Billy Joel. People pay, you know, a thousand bucks to sit front row at a Billy Joel concert. Right. And if they would be seen publicly with him singing it, everybody, you know, <laughs> look at me. I'm with Billy Joel. He's singing. But if you're Billy Joel's daughter... And it's the most embarrassing thing in the world. At any rate, so two of the spies came back with good reports. Joshua and Caleb. Joshua. And the other one was Caleb or Caleb. Interestingly, by the way, his name is related to the word Kelev, which means a dog, man's best friend. And a Kelev is Kol Lave. All heart. All heart. What is, what is a dog? A dog doesn't judge you. Why is a dog loyal? Because he's ha he has that emotional bond to you, and that's it. Kalev was dog-like in a, in, in, a, a positive in a positive way. way that he was, he was not rattled. He certainly understood the philosophical argument of the other ten spies, but he didn't let that get to him, and he remained loyal. Now, one of the things we know about how and, and, and it's not because he was a dumb guy. To the contrary, I mean, you should, you know, you should know who Kalev was. Um, great scholar. And certainly he was, he was smart enough to have been um, drawn after some of the overthinking of the other spies. So how, and in fact, we know he was conflicted. He was conflicted. How did he manage the conflict? So it says there in, in the Torah portion of Shlach, that as he was scouting the land, he stopped in Hebron. Hebron is one of the holy cities, second only actually to Yerushalayim, Yerushalayim being the holiest city in Judaism, the second being Hebron. And what's in Hebron? 
is Marat Machpela. The cave of the patriarchs and matriarchs. So what, did, what was he doing there? Was he stopping there? It says, commentary, Rashi brings this commentary on the verse, but it's taken from our sages, that when he felt himself faltering, when he felt that maybe he's going to be pulled into the, the, uh, the plan of the spies, the other ten spies, he says, i got to pray. And he, he specifically went to the burial site of the patriarchs and matriarchs to have that extra boost, to add potency to his prayer. And now we're talking about a guy who doesn't have to have a strong faith to know that God exists and runs the world. This is a guy he left who Egypt. saw the ten plays. He was at the splitting of the sea. He crossed the Red Sea on dry he land. He received the Torah at Sinai. He was at Mount Sinai. He heard he God's voice. He studied Torah from Moses every day. <laughs> studied Torah from Moses every day. Yeah. And even he felt that he would be different and have a prayer that was more intense and effective at the gravesite of a righteous person. That's right. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. And how do you think he prayed there? What well, do you say at the gravesite of a righteous person? You know, that's an interesting, that's a really interesting question. Because I can give you the pat answer, the safe answer, and I can give you the honest answer. They're both honest. I would never lie. I can give you the pat answer, which is true, but I could give you also maybe a little bit funkier answer, which is also true. But And being a Gemini, I will say to you both, please. So you're also a Gemini? Of course. Okay. So you know that I'm a Gemini because I told you my Parsha was Shlach. Mine was Korach. Wow. Okay. So um, I'm older than you. Could be. Because Korach generally, well, gen- Korach is always a week after Shlach. Okay. I'm 21 Sivan. What are you? 16 Sivan. You're older than me. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh-oh. Yeah. So they say that, um, how does a joke go? I don't believe in astrology because I'm a Gemini, and Geminis don't believe in astrology. <laughs> right? That joke only works if you're a Gemini. You can't say that about Sagittarius. The joke is Gemini is the contradiction. So it's a contradiction do you want chicken or beef? Yes. Yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. What was the contradiction we were discussing? You're going to give me the pat answer? Oh, the pat answer. Okay. And the pat answer the is, deeper answer. Well, there's a book. <laughs> it's called The Manoloshin, and it was composed by um, the second Rebbe of Chabad when he would visit his father's grave. And uh, it's composed of various different traditional prayers um, and excerpts from holy writings. And you read that book. That's the pat answer. Now I'll give you the other answer. Okay. Okay. I was uh, talking to a group of college students, about 500 college students, who had come to Brooklyn <coughs> to, um, for, for a Shabbos, a Shabbaton in Brooklyn, in Crown Heights. And at the end of the Shabbaton, so they brought them to Queens, about 30, 40 minutes away, to Old Montefiore Cemetery, which is where the resting place of the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe and the Lubavitcher Rebbe, a blessed memory, in the same... They rest side by side. Side by side. So... Um, we went there, and I was asked to sort of explain to them what, what we're doing. And um, there was sort of like a little discussion beforehand about whether or not we needed to sort of uh, put them at ease about the fact that they were in a cemetery. You know, it might, maybe it might feel weird to them. I guess cemeteries are sort of generally associated as sort of maybe a creepy place. I don't know. So there were two different schools of thought. But my... No, I gave it away. Who's who? I, I, okay, fine. So obviously I agree with my school of thought because I meant it then <laughs> I mean it now. But okay. okay. I wanted to remain neutral. I wanted to say there were just two sides and you could decide. It's okay. There's two sides. Okay, there are two sides. You know, being a Gemini, I could have been both of those sides. 
And you must be able to argue both sides. And I can argue both sides. <laughs> of course. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Well, one argument is you got to explain it to them because otherwise it's sort of creepy and it's weird and what are we doing in a cemetery? Um, the other argument was, look, if this would be the early 90s and we would bring the same group of students, same 500 college kids to, actually it was 1,000 college kids and they had to do them two shifts because there wasn't enough space. And these would, this would be the same 500 or 1,000 college kids uh, coming to uh, Crown Heights for a Shabbaton, well, and it was a Sunday morning. What would we do Sunday morning? I can tell you, I can guarantee you what we do. The Lubavitcher Rebbe, well into his 90s, would stand hours and hours and hours a day, I mean, not every day, but on Sundays, every week, and receive anyone who wanted to meet him, and they would have a moment of interaction, and the Rebbe would give everyone a dollar, which was the idea of the dollar, and the Rebbe said, said this was to make you an emissary for a mitzvah, which mitzvah specifically tzedakah, charity. He's giving you the dollar, now... You go give it to someone you who needs it. it. Now usually what happened to people would keep that dollar because it has special meaning coming from, from the Rebbe's hand, but then you replace it with another dollar, if not many more dollars. But the point was that, the, that this, this moment sort of becomes crystallized in this call to action. Now, now tag you're it. Now right. it's on you. Now go do a mitzvah. Anyway, so I said, look, if this would be the 90s, you know, we would take them and line them up and they would wait, you know, four hours and uh, they would have their moment with the Rebbe and get a dollar and that's what would happen. And now, now we can't do that. So we do this. But, I, but, but the argument being that really it's, it's the same experience. So... If you emphasize the idea that it's a cemetery, are you taking away from the idea that really this is a one-on-one -on -one meeting with a tzaddik? I'll, I'll tell you a story. I, I know a guy He's not a rabbi. He's in business. He was doing a business deal. And he was doing a business deal with a non-Jewish partner. And he said to this non-Jewish partner, would you like to come to the resting place of the Rebbe? They were nearby, and he brought him to, to the Ohel. And this fellow's father is buried in the same cemetery. And he had a conflict all of a sudden. Does he visit his father's grave or not? Because he's just spoken to this non-Jew who's obviously uninitiated in this whole thing. And now, if he's going to stop off at his father's grave, does it totally confuse this non-Jewish friend about what's happening? In other words... We're going to such an important place. Why would we make a detour on the way to the... This holy, holy place. Right. And, and, and more than that, is this something of universal significance or is this like personal? Is this sentimental? This okay. is, about, is this about family? Here he is. After all, remember, this is a non-Jewish person. So, you know, he's obviously appealing to him that this is something that's universal. And the more parochial, the more clannish that it becomes, the more like he's visiting his father's grave, then the less relevant it is to the friend. Okay. So he had a conflict. Anyways, he, he told his non-Jewish friend to sit down and write a letter. There's paper and pen there. People write little notes. And then while his non-Jewish friend was writing, he ran like the Dickens out onto the cemetery. And he said quickly to, at his father's gravesite, he said, Ta, I'm sorry. I'll come visit again another time. I'm taking care of important business. And he ran back in before his non-Jewish friend saw that he had disappeared. And then they went to the Ohel without any mention whatsoever that he himself had his own father buried in that cemetery. Okay. So the discussion about these college students was, 
what what do we want them to feel that you know we're 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 visiting a cemetery, we're going to a grave, or that this is a connection with a tzaddik, with a righteous person, with a holy person. And the emphasis on cemetery is a distraction from that. So just like if we, this is, this is the point that I made, if we were going to visit the Rebbe in 770, you know, in the world headquarters in the big synagogue on Eastern Parkway and waiting in line for, for dollars, uh, we wouldn't contextualize it by saying, by the way, I want you to understand we're in an inner city Brooklyn neighborhood right now, and that's where the world headquarters of Lubavitch happens to be located. Right. The experience would speak for itself. The experience would speak for itself. In the same way, why do we have to contextualize it and say we're at Old Montefiore Cemetery? It's an experience. So I decided experience has to speak for itself. And the experience is that connection with, with the tzaddik. So I told them this story, which is one of my favorite stories. A teacher of mine, <clears throat> this is the, um, by the way, if you need to be reminded what the thread here is, this is the second answer, meaning the more raw answer to the question, what do you say when you go to the gravesite of a tzaddik? So I had a teacher who had a teacher. And my teacher, when he was a bar mitzvah boy, when he was 13, this was in the era when Lubavitch was pretty small, to the extent that every 13-year-old bar mitzvah boy could have a personal audience with the Rebbe. They would go into the Rebbe's room and have what's known as yichidus. Yichidus means that one-on-one. -on -one. <clears throat> so he's 13 years old, and he doesn't know what to do. So he asked his teacher, and he says, when I go into the Rebbe, for my yichidus, for my one-on-one, -on -one, what do I do? So the teacher, and you have to understand the sort of like Chabad Russian style. You know, there's a certain rough, gruff quality to it. But okay. it's, a bit like a martial arts instructor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and but it's 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 meant with love, right? Of so it might sound very curt or even, you know, cutting. But all right. So he says to him, "When I go into the Rebbe for my yichidus, for my one-on-one, -on -one, what do I say? What do I do?" So the teacher says, "Okay, forget it. I'll go for you. You give me the spot. I'll go and study you." So the thirteen-year-old says, "No, no, no. I'm just asking. When I go into the Rebbe, what do I do?" The teacher says again. Okay, good. Give me the spot. I'll go instead of you. So the boy is bewildered, and he says, why, why are you saying this to me? The teacher says like this. Gan se'ilum haze is al medishikra. So you have a whole sentence. It's Yiddish and Aramaic. <laughs> and, and Hebrew. Three okay. languages. Okay. Gan is Yiddish. Olam haze, olam haze is Hebrew. Al medishikra is Aramaic. Three languages in one sentence. Okay. The whole physical world is a world of falsehood. Nothing's what it seems. It's all facade. We play a role. We wear a mask. And there's one dalad ames shel emes, he tells him. One four cubits. That's a rabbinic idiom for a, a place. Four cubits is generally the wingspan of a person. So personal space, you know, like your personal bubble, mm -hmm. is, you know, that, that's the four cubits. So he says, there's one Dalad Amishel Emes. There's one four cubits of truth in the whole world. And that's when you're standing in front of your Rebbe. And in the place of truth, you're asking how to speak and how to behave. If that's the case, you're asking me how I would speak and how I would behave. I'll go instead of you. So the lesson is, in that place of truth, you can only be yourself. There's no script. Right. So you ask how to behave when you go to the Ohel. So the official answer is, here, I'll hand you the Manoloshin. Read this book. Follow the instructions. You're good. But if you're really asking me, I would say you can't do it wrong. You can't have a plan. You just need to go there. And you need to be who you are. Don't try to do anything. Just be yourself. And, and 
in a certain way, what I would say is experience yourself. I'll, I'll tell you like this. Sometimes in, in Kabbalah, we refer to the tzaddik, to the righteous person, as the tree of life. And one explanation is, there are many different meanings to that metaphor of tree of life, but one meaning is that just like a tree, the root system is often more complex and more vast than the tree that's above ground. What we appreciate about the holy and righteous person is the tip of the iceberg. So to say I'm going to experience the tzaddik is almost chutzpah. But to say, in the presence of the tzaddik, I will experience my true self, or have a glimmer of my true self, that, that's, that's a very wholesome idea. Which goes back to how we started, which is, when I need to talk to God, God is the same wherever I go. God is the same on any day of the year. God is the same in any group of people I stand in. But there are places and times and groups where I am more connected, mm -hmm. when I am more primed to have that, that connection. And now we're saying what it means to be primed is, is to be more yourself. Your Which soul, is the entire concept of before you, uh, you occupied this body and this journey, who you were. Your essence. Teshuvah, repentance, what we translate as repentance in English, really meaning return, meaning to revert to your essence. Mm. Right, which is, by the way, how Yom Kippur, uh, Yom Kippur works based on this principle. How, how, how does atonement work? Atonement, by the way, was pointed out to me, is a word, the etymology is um, actually Kabbalistic. I mean, it was intended, it's not an accident. Some things are divine providence, some things We're talking are, about the English word atonement. Yeah, the English word, yeah. yeah. At one mint. Yes. So the atonement, the mechanism of atonement is the at one mint, which is Kabbalistically 100% accurate. The idea is like this. Let's see, let's see how quickly we can do this. There are three levels of the soul. Nefesh, ruach, neshama. Nefesh animates your physical actions. Most basic level of being alive is that you can do. Ruach is a little bit more ephemeral than that. That animates the emotions. And neshama is more rarefied still, and that's the power behind intellect. <coughs> three levels of the soul correspond to three prayers a day. Do you praise three times every day? Might have the evening prayer, you know, for in the Jewish calendar, the day starts at night. Shachos, the morning prayer, Mincha, the afternoon prayer. Now, <coughs> excuse me, there are days of the year when we have four prayers. We have an additional prayer corresponding to the additional sacrifice brought in the temple. So on a Shabbos or Rosh Chodesh or a Yom Tov, we have a fourth prayer. And that corresponds to the fourth level. What's the fourth level? We said there's three levels of the soul. Ah, three levels that are manifest within you. And then there's another level called Chaya, which is transcendent. It's not manifest within you. It is above. What does it mean above? Not spatially above. What it means is it's not normally manifest within us. It's the capacity for self-sacrifice, which sort of goes against the the three levels of the soul that are manifest in the body, which perpetuate the body, this is the, the opposite of that, the, 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 the willingness to surrender being in a body. Um, and that level, that soul level, we really only tap into on those days where we have a fourth prayer service. Then there's one day a year, one day, where we have a fifth prayer. Or we have a kneeler service. Right. At the very end, the waning hours. That's why many shuls have windows on the eastern wall. So you see it getting darker and darker. On Yom Kippur. On Yom Kippur, as the day starts to end. And in those twilight hours, we put in one more prayer service. 
And that, that fifth prayer service corresponds to the fifth level of the soul. What's the fifth level? The most transcendent of all, which is called Yechida. Yechida means oneness. Why oneness. is it called? So how does the atonement, the at one work? That when that place within you that was always at one with God is brought to the fore, then anything that might have happened to damage your relationship with God can only be seen on a superficial level. It's all superficial. It's all extraneous. The essence was untouched. So the whole idea of atonement is returning to your true status, or your true status, your true, um, your essence, your, uh, the real you. The real you. The real you. You've you got to peel away this, 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 these layers of muck that you've acquired. Well, the layers aren't muck. Okay. The layers are your soul, uh -huh. and you put muck on the layers. That's what I'm saying, yes. You have to peel away the layers that got mucked up. Right. Until you get to the layer which cannot, which is impervious which is impervious to any damage that you might do to it. Okay. And you see the relationship between that yichida level of the soul to, the, to another word we mentioned earlier, yichidos, the one-on-one -on -one meeting with the tzaddik. In other words, what happens when you interface with that tzaddik? It's like a mini Yom Kippur. In other words, if you were to say, I met the tzaddik and I met a truly great man, I would say, in all humility, that wasn't the point. And I say this, by, by the way, based on a story. There was a young man who uh, went on to become the chairman of the London Diamond Bourse, a very prominent philanthropist named Freddie Hager. All of a sudden, he passed away. But he met the Rebbe at 3 in the morning at a Yechidus when he was a young man in his 20s. And when he, he wasn't Lubavitch, he wasn't, he, he was convinced somebody sent him to the Rebbe. When he came out, he said, I hadn't been adequately prepared for my meeting with the Rebbe. He said, I went in thinking I was going to meet a great man, and I left realizing I had met myself. Right. So if you go into the meeting with the Tadik saying, I've, I met the Tadik and I met a great man, Humbly, let me, let me suggest that you missed the point. But if you say, I met the tzaddik, and in doing so, I was awakened to my own potential. Yeah. Now we're getting somewhere. And this brings us back to the same, I mean, this is where we started. What are we doing going to the resting place of a tzaddik? Isn't God everywhere? And the answer is yes, of course God is everywhere. But there are certain places, there are certain times, there are certain relationships that bring out in me my potential. And if by going to those places and those times and, and standing with those people and being in those relationships brings out a, a hidden depth, more than just a depth, the depth, the essence, brings it out of me, now what we have is much more than an experience. An experience is fleeting. You have it and it's over. It becomes a memory. It's nice. Right. Yeah, you post it on Facebook, and that's it, and people can see that you did it, you know? You cross it off the bucket list. Yeah. But if it reveals something in you, you get a letter that says, oh, you didn't realize you have a, a checking account that you never closed. You didn't even know about it. There's 10,000 bucks sitting there. You're the long-lost son of the king. But you're the long-lost son of the king. <laughs> you're a prince. So you didn't that, even know. That's an experience, obviously, that moment of, Wow. But it has some ongoing ramifications. That's the point. Okay. You don't come out of such a meeting and just go back to what you were doing before. Can't. You must come out with a mission. And so, and, and the, the irony is, the paradox for you Geminis, is that you come out completely different and unchanged. Because what's been revealed to you is who you've been all along, which is the most profound insight that we can ever have about ourselves or about anything. When you hear something that's really true, something that's really mind-blowing, the mark of that truth is you say, you know what? I always knew that. Mm -hmm. Why didn't I ever think of that? I always knew it. And when you have that type of 
epiphany about yourself. Like, of course, of course that's who I am. That kind of truth, it leaves you, you can't be different. I mean, you can't, you cannot go on not acting differently now. And yet you're unchanged. Yeah. Yeah. What's amazing is how <coughs> when we talk about the muck that gets in the way of knowing who we are, because once we know who we are, then we start to understand why we were sent here, right? That, that's what I'm saying. It's a mission. I, this, I think this is the most important question for everybody is to understand you're a unique person. You were put in this world to do a job that only you can do. But if you don't know who you are, how could you possibly do that job? You don't know what your role is. You don't know why you were sent. You don't know where you were sent to, who you were sent to, et cetera. And what gets in the way of that discovery very often are these, you know, these determinations that we make about ourselves when we're children who get hurt. Somebody oh, wow. said about... Sal, now you're getting really <laughs> deep here. Whoa. I mean... Whoa, it, you're getting real. Right? Let's do it. All right. There's a whole new, <laughs> you're, peeling, you're peeling a whole new layer. Let's talk about, the, talk, let's talk about the trauma. Let's talk about the, yeah, the false self that we develop. Talk, yes. Talk to me. The false sense. I mean, everybody has this moment when they're a kid and and before this moment you and a bunch of other kids you're all the same in fact you don't even really know where you begin and they end mm -hmm. you're, you're like this collective consciousness with mm -hmm. other children and then at some point some kid turns to you and says you look funny you're red i i had very bright red hair when i was a kid you're a carrot top you know you're a bozo brain uh or some kid is smart uh, you're a geek you know, some kid is good at sports. They say, oh, you're a muscle head. And no matter what they say, it distinguishes you from the others. Mm -hmm. And so you take it as some kind of an attack. You feel vulnerable. Then you come up with some kind of a, a way to rationalize or explain or defend. Mm -hmm. And then that thing you come up with that you think works for you becomes your whole identity. And it was an identity that you assume when you were five years old mm -hmm. and didn't know anything about the mm -hmm. world. And now you... You, you depend on it, and you nurse this thing all your life. And I think that is what gets stripped away when you finally come to these moments of, of, of MS, of real truth about yourself. You think, my God, I've been laboring under uh, you know, this, this, this uniform that I put on, this, this, this protective gear <laughs> that, I, that I strapped on myself when I was five. You ever heard the explanation of Kol Nidre, first, you know, prayer of Yom Kippur? You're going into the to the holy day, and we have an annulment of vows. So one one explanation, which I find particularly poignant, and it echoes exactly what you're saying, is the promises I made to myself. What's the annulment of vows? Promises I made to myself. Usually when I was much younger and much more foolish, or even if we don't, won't call it foolish, ignorant, I made certain assumptions, and under those assumptions I made certain commitments. I am not beholden to, com to, to commit the rest of my life living up to promises made by a younger, more ignorant version of myself. All right. God forbid you should be, because then you're going to waste so much time when you could be doing the thing you were set to a, do. There's, there's a mourning, there's a grieving that goes on when we realize, not that we can't have what we want, when we realize that we no longer want what we wanted. Not getting what you want, you learn how, you know. That's life. That's life. But there's a grief I had this dream and it, not only I had a dream the dream had me it defined me it became who I am or at least what I, what I thought I, I was and I wake up one day to realize that having that in my life really isn't what my life is about and I've built so much in trying to attain that thing and for, for whom? To whom am I indebted to spend my life this way? To, to an old version of myself. To an old version of myself. But 
there's a there's a feeling of loss when I have to realize that um, what I thought would make me feel fulfilled isn't what makes me feel fulfilled. And I'm not sure which is more tragic when we find it out on the way to attaining that goal or after we've already attained it. I think Jim Carrey said, you know, he was the first one to make uh, $10 million in a, in a movie. Mm-hmm. And that was an attainment of a dream. I mean, he, when he was homeless, living in a car, he wrote a check to himself, $10 million, and he carried that check with him. And you really see that trach gut wird sein gut, that power of thinking. You know, in Yiddish, we say, think good, it'll be good. But, you know, thoughts are things. And uh, he eventually had a $10 million check. He was paid $10 million, I think, in the 90s. I forget which, which role it was. But the point is, so he said, I wish every man, woman, and child could achieve all of their wildest dreams so that they could find out that it won't make them happy. And there, there's a couple of ways you could read that. One is that, you know, happiness is an inside job. It's not because of anything that is, you know, that, that you receive. It's about what you're doing, about what you're giving. But I think there's something even deeper than that, which is that, you know, we're, we're pretty powerful. And when we want something bad enough, we can actually put it out there and make it happen. Um... And yet, what's that? There's, I think there's a country music song, Thank God for Unanswered Prayers. Sometimes what we're putting out there and what we really genuinely believe is so crucial. And we mean it. We really mean it. With all the best intentions, it's just not where we need to be putting our energy. So part of teshuva part of the return to true self, probably the emotionally most demanding part of it is the letting go. The letting go, being willing to meet your true self and find out that it is different, maybe even radically so, than the constructed sense of self that you've been clinging to. Right. That's terrifying because... Then who am I? Who am I? Who am I? And, and what have I been doing all this time? Yeah, I think there's a Tolstoy uh, line, one of the characters. He says, well, what if I had lived my entire life wrong? What have I been doing with my life? It was all on a trajectory, and the trajectory was false target. So really, when it comes down to it, the most important thing for, for teshuva is what we call bittel. So to nullify, to nullify yourself before... Nullifying yourself. Nullifying yourself means to let go of the expectations. To say, you know what? I don't know who I am, and, and it's okay. I have a lot of ideas about who I think I am, and they may be right, they may be wrong, but I'm going to let go of that. I'm going I'm to let God tell me who I am. It's like the journey of the first Jew, Abraham. God says, Lech Lecha. What is Lech Lecha? Go for yourself. Go to yourself. Discover yourself. Leave Ma'artzcha, your land. Leave the place where you were born. Leave your father's, father's house. house, meaning all that environmental stuff. Ela aretz to the land. Asher areka, simple translation, to the land that I will show you. Meaning, when you get there, I'll let you know. But said this explains Ela aretz asher areka, to the place where I will show you. I will ah. show you. You're going to come to a place. You're going to abandon everything you knew about yourself, and you come to a place, God says to Abraham, where I will get to show you your true self. But you can't see your true self until you let go of everything you thought you knew about yourself, your and, whole story. And cross a river. Right? And cross a river. Cross this moment. Cross a stream. Cross this place that's always changing and that you can never step in twice because you keep changing. Right, and and my question, what I want to ask you with that is, 
people will say to me, people will say to you, okay, but Abraham, God told him. Mm. Mm. He heard God's voice. Right. He knew it was God. God said right. go. Right. No one said to me go. I didn't hear God's voice. Right. When is, how is God going to show me me if God never talks to me? Yeah. Well, for that, you have to believe in divine providence. That God is speaking to us all the time in the language of events. In alts vos mizet, daf mina reis nem in hero in avedas Hashem. Baal Shem Tov said, in everything that you see, in alts vos mizet, un alts vos mehert, in everything that you hear, you have to bring out an instruction in how to serve Hashem. Hashem is not just running the world according to his design. It's more than that. He's using the world as his means of communication with you. Mm. So there's no detail that's not a message. Everything's a message. Everything is communication. God speaks 8 billion languages. And probably more because even to each individual, there are many different languages with which God speaks to us. Okay. But every detail is a communication. Now, deciphering the message is another skill. But one of the things we have to be sensitive to, (coughs) sorry again, Uh, messages to us that have to do with where we are needed. When we have any sense of uh, calling, that's probably an important message. In other words, there are places where I go to get my needs met, and there are places where I go because I'm needed there. Generally speaking, God will take care of making sure my needs are met. I have everything I need, and if I don't have it, it means I probably don't need it. So my father takes care of me, and I don't have to put in extra, you know, extra, too much, uh, what do you call it, uh, superfluous, uh, yeah, superfluous effort. Effort into getting my needs met. I think a lot of times, you know, that's the rat race, is that we're putting tons of effort into um, security, making a living, social standing, all that kind of stuff. Whatever you need, you're going to be taken care of. What's the one area where God sort of gives us a lot of room is making sure that we're living up to what we're needed for. And, and he sends us signals but we have to respond to the signal. Hakol bide shamayim chutz mirat shamayim. Everything is in the hands of heaven except the fear of heaven. So how the world is being conducted, that's his business. My emotional reaction, meaning how I internalize it, whether I choose to live in awe of God, I like the word awe better than fear, mm-hmm. whether I choose to live in awe of God or in awe of people, places, and things, that's, that's my business. So if I get a signal that uh, God may be able to take care of me better in one place than in in another, I don't necessarily trust my interpretation of that because he can take care of me just as well one place as he can in another. But if I get a signal that I'm more useful in in one place than in another, then then I need to respond to that. You know, there's a story. (coughs) There was a chassid who was a watchmaker. And he lived in a, I forgot which town he lived in, but uh, he lived in one of the middle-sized towns, and he couldn't make a living as a watchmaker. Anyways, he went to the Rebbe Marash, who was the fourth Chabad Rebbe, and he told him he can't make a living, but he had heard that there was this small town um, where they needed a watchmaker, and he could maybe he could make a living there. But it's very, it's like a far-flung place. There's really no Jewish community, and really the only Jews who live there are Cantonists. These are Jews who had been forcibly conscripted into the Tsar's army, and the the period of conscription was some... 25 years. Could, yeah, 25. So by the time they came out, 
you know, this, this is like a guy who comes out of prison. You know, he's been in, a middle-aged man who the last time he was in the world right, was There was no teenager. freedom of religion in the Tsar's right. army. So, no, no, there was not only not freedom of religion, but they were, it was actively, you know, uh, they, they were, they were. You were liable to execution right. if you did Jewish things. So yeah. they knew they were Jewish because they were persecuted, but they had no, I mean, they forget about Hebrew school. There, there, was, there was nothing. All they knew was that they were Jewish. Mm. So they were completely ignorant Jews. But they knew they were Jewish, so they, they had communities. And when they came out of the army, they would live amongst each other, and they had Jewish communities. They had a shul. What was a shul? They couldn't run a shul. They, they, they couldn't read Hebrew. I mean, understandably. Anyway, so he says, the only Jewish community are these Cantonists. But I might be able to make a living. So the Rebbe Marash told him, you should go. So he goes there, and he came back uh, like a year later, and he says... Thank God I'm doing well, I'm making money hand, and money hand over fist. It's really was a good move. But, um, you know, I'm very busy with work, and I don't even have time for my own spiritual growth. And the Rebbe Marash answered in a very interesting way. He says, well, what about the classes that you're giving, you know, these unlearned Jews? He says, Rebbe, I just said, I'm so busy with my work, I don't even have time for my own spiritual growth. Now you're asking about other people's spiritual growth. He says, you realize that nobody can read, so I'm the, I read the Torah in the, in the, in the synagogue on, uh, on Shabbat, and I'm, 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 I'm the chazan, because no, no one can, no, no, knows how to pray. So I'm so busy with that stuff, and I don't even have time for myself, and I have work, thank God. And the Rebbe says to him again, what about the classes? What about studying with the... With, where do I have time? Where do I have time to study with other people? So the Rebbe Marash says to him, do you honestly believe that the creator of the heavens and the earth could not have found a way to provide a livelihood for you in your old town and could only give you a panosa, only give you livelihood in that little backwater town? That is not the reason that you were sent there and not the reason why I gave you a blessing to move there. You were put there. For them. For them. Not because of what you need, because what you're needed for. And you're a watchmaker and you should realize what a fine precision watch works. <laughs> this is that God put That's you right. that last missing little gear that needed to be in that town. Yeah. Yeah. So... Divine providence, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, God spoke to Abraham. When did he speak to me? He's speaking to you right now. You know, we, uh, this is the month leading up to Rosh Hashanah. Uh, we're just a little over a week away now. And at the beginning of this month, we started reading Psalm 27. And we read it all through this month and all through the high holiday period. And, and in that prayer, in that psalm, we say, in the words of King David, only one thing. Do I ask that I should dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, that I should gaze on the beauty of the Lord and frequent his temple? Only this. Right. <laughs> Only this. One small thing. <laughs> One small thing. Uh, but I think it's such a beautiful prayer because, yes, we, we do live in the house of the Lord, and it's available to us to recognize that if we would see around us that the master of the house is running this house and we're walking around so it. So I'll, I'll tell you a, 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 another layer within those words, such beautiful words. First of all, it's like you know, just one little thing, and you're right, it's not one little thing, it's, it's everything. There's another, there's another dimension to it. He says, I'm asking for one thing, but then he gives a shopping list. Yeah. <laughs> and within the shopping list, there's a little contradiction. Gemini again, right? Okay. What's the contradiction? He says, Shivti Beves Hashem, that my residence, where I, you know, Yeshiva, my, my, where I sit, where I'm saddled, mm -hmm. should be the house of God. Ulavakar Behecholai, Bikur means a visit, and I should visit his holy abode. Which one is it? Are you a resident or are you a visitor? Are you settled? 
or are you just, you know, are you a tourist taking pictures? Mm -hmm. So the answer is, that's why it's one thing. He's not asking for the laundry list. He's asking for the paradox. One thing is the paradox, that I should be a resident in the house of God. This should be my constant state. And yet, it should never become old hat. I should have the appreciation of a visitor I should for feel whom like everything is new. Like everything is new at all times, which is also the paradox, the same exact paradox we were talking about before about teshuva, about one of these experiences where you're left and you can't, you can never live the same as before, but yet you're, you haven't been changed because really you were introduced to the true you, who you've been all along. So it's like there's the constancy and the fluidity at the same time. There's the newness and the oldness at the same time. There's really nothing new. This is who I've always been, and yet, wow, this is who I am. There's that appreciation. And each time I have that sense of discovery of something new, I should feel settled within that sense of discovery. In other words, it, it shouldn't take me aback so much. I'm like, oh, yeah, that, that, that was great, but I'll go back to life. No, now you need to live in these discoveries. Right. Right. You know, and I want to bring you back to, and, and, and our time is winding down, but the first time that I heard you speak, you told a story that is directly relevant to this idea of you are called. You know, God places around you a message, a, a calling where you can identify, oh, that, that's a place where I'm needed. That's a place where I've got to go. I'm not sure mm -hmm. why, mm -hmm. but I can see I need to go there. Mm -hmm. And it was the story of the basketball coach. Oh, you like that? Yeah. <laughs> I never forgot that story, but I'll ask you to tell it. Yeah. Story about the coach. Well, first of all, you have to know that the coach was a guy. He was a sort of a fixture at the Fabrengens, at the... Uh, public gatherings of the Lubavitcher Rebbe in 770 uh, during the 80s. And he was a colorful guy. I mean, he... Okay, at the Fabrengens, most people there... So explain what a Fabrengen okay, is. Okay, the, the, the Rebbe would uh, assemble, gather uh, his chassidim, and really everyone who wanted to come, you know, all, all walks of life would be present there. And mostly the format was that I would teach, uh, that I would, for hours, for hours, um, teaching new ideas. And, but it was sort of, in, in a certain way, it was interactive, as interactive as you can be when there's one person who's giving highly, highly scholarly and, and um, sometimes very abstruse subject matter um, for hours, you know, sort of like, imagine like, like a, 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 a professor is lecturing and yet there's sort of like, at the same time, I hesitate to call it like a party atmosphere because that might sound a little bit, um, not as reverent as it should, but in between the talks, there's singing, group singing, which are Hasidic melodies, and then... It's like if a s football crowd was at a physics lecture. Football crowd at a physics lecture. And appreciating the lecture. Yeah, or or if or if a f maybe the physics crowd went to the football game. I don't know. I have to figure <laughs> this out. But yeah, okay. And 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 also there was this one-on-one -on -one interaction. If you'll you'll you can watch the videos and you see how there's this symbolic r toasting l'chaim, raising your glass to toast l'chaim. These little little cups of wine or of, of vodka. And the Rebbe would make eye contact with everybody in the room one, one by one. And, and there's a thousand people in that room. And there's room. a thousand people. And give them that, that moment. Which, by the way, we were talking about Yechidus earlier. The Rebbe said that after the, there were too many people who wanted one-on-one -on -one meetings, the Rebbe said that coming to the public gatherings is also a Yechidus. That one-on-one -on -one moment. At any rate, so the coach was this unusual guy. He was dressed differently, and he was like, he used to wear this bucket hat and this windbreaker, 
and he would stand up on the bench and he would pump his fist like like a coach, like he's coach, like like he's coaching the Fabrengen. Okay, it was unusual. Anyways, how did he end up in seven seventy? The many of the Rebbe's Fabrengens were on satellite feed at the time, which was actually very much ahead of its time as far as you know in the in the eighties. Not just in the... There was know, no internet. Right. It was way before Kids internet. Kids can't imagine right, this. Right, <laughs> Yeah. And they used to... We didn't even have answering machines. <laughs> um, did we have answering machines then? A little with a little... With a like little if, you, if you called someone and they weren't home, the phone rang. Oh, you're talking about <laughs> those days. No, but in the 80s, we had the little tape cassette answering machines, didn't we? Like by the mid-80s, I think. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. So this was in the times, either before answering machines or, if, at best, a little a cassette. They don't even know what a cassette tape is. Right. In the boom okay. box, but they don't okay. know what that is. Yeah. <laughs> so anyways, the, 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 the Fabrengen was telecast. It was, it was on satellite. And the coach was watching it on, on TV. And he sees that it says 770 Eastern Parkway, Crown Heights, Brooklyn, Lubavitch World Headquarters. So he didn't speak a word of Yiddish. And right, so people fair. get this. So this is local TV, right? It's at that satellite, the UHF channels, right? So back then, we had about five channels that were the network channels, yeah. right? one local <laughs> channel. And then there were these weird channels yeah. where that was like public access TV yes. and, yeah. you know, and maybe Korean TV or something like that. Right. But just a few staticky channels. Right. It was the smaller knob. <laughs> the smaller knob on, on the, the TV. TV. With more numbers on it. Right. Smaller knob with Sort more of like numbers. radio on TV. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And it was the round antenna. Yes, the round <laughs> antenna behind the, the, the rabbit ears. <laughs> uh-huh. So, yeah, so he sees the satellite feed of the Fabreng, and he's like, I got to go there. I got to meet this rabbi. He didn't understand a word of Yiddish, so he didn't know what the Rebbe was talking about, but he was taken. He lived in Long Island, and he comes to Crown Heights, comes to Brooklyn, and he walks in, and he's like, I'm here to meet the rabbi from the TV. Like, that's not how it's done. You don't just stroll in and say, I'm here to meet. Now, there was such a concept as dollars I mentioned before. When you wait in line, it's, it's a scheduled for thing. For hours. It's for hours. And it's, it, it's, a, it's a set thing. You don't just show up and say, I'm here to meet the rabbi. <laughs> so they said it's not really possible. But he was persistent. He said, no, I have to meet the rabbi. This is like, like you saw the royal wedding on TV. You fly right. to England. You walk into Buckingham Palace. Right. I'd yeah. like to meet the queen. Right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's exactly what it's like. And the people will tell me, that's not possible. It's just not possible. He says, no, but this is what I came for. So finally somebody says, look, when the Rebbe will have to come out to, to Davin to pray the afternoon prayer, you could see the Rebbe at that point. The Rebbe comes out of his room and he comes out to, to, to pray. So you could, you could see him then. Okay. He took that to mean he's going to have his little meeting that he wanted to have. So the Rebbe came out to pray. And this guy makes a beeline for the Rebbe. He ran straight to the Rebbe, gets right in the Rebbe's face, which that itself was an anomaly. You know, just so you understand, the, the reverence that people had for the Rebbe, you know, you might see people run away when the Rebbe came into a room if you felt that you weren't necessarily on your best behavior or even considered that you might not be. You, you would go hide. So to run straight to the Rebbe was very unusual. And it's also, it's a, it's a lack of decorum. It's just sort of frenetic. and You don't behave that way. He ran straight to the Rebbe. He gets right up close. And he bursts out, all excited. He says, Rabbi, my name is Abe Zacks, and I'm the coach of the Harlem Globetrotters. Now, that was true. He was the coach of the Harlem Globetrotters. Um, not the founder, that was another Jew, but he was the coach. Um, it's a big show, the Harlem Globetrotters. I saw them in Madison yeah, Square Garden. Yeah, it's yeah. amazing. So, yeah, I could see it's sort of a big deal, mm -hmm. but in that world, it's a big deal. <laughs> to come into 770. Crown Heights, not such a big Crown deal. Heights, <laughs> right, and start, I'm the coach of the Harlem Globetrotters, and to run up, in, right up to the Rebbe and start blurting out, I'm the coach of the Harlem Globetrotters is really... It's weird. It's weird behavior. And if I will tell you that the Rebbe was not taken aback, it probably won't shock you because if you, you know, if you know even a little bit about the Rebbe, you know that his way of putting people at ease 
and giving, showing people respect was, was legendary. So if I tell you that Ebbett didn't shame him or that Ebbett didn't you know, look at him askance, that, that probably won't shock you. But that Ebbett's reaction was just so, I think, just very didactic. I mean, we can learn so much from this. And it was a one-liner. That Ebbett looks at this guy and says, I don't want to say like in a perturbed fashion, because it wasn't that, but like almost, almost like slightly annoyed, but annoyed's not the right word, uh, like businesslike, that Ebbett said, good, I need a coach. And that, Ebbe, and that Ebbe proceeded to his place for afternoon prayers. So what happened at that moment? The guy comes and he says, basically, I'm, a, I, I'm, I'm this interesting guy. I'm this different guy. I'm, you know, I'm not like anyone else here. And one response would be, okay, that's all right. We're tolerant folk. <laughs> and we'll, we'll find a place for you. We can deal with you. But the Rebbe's response was like, oh, you're the coach? Get to work. Yeah. I need a coach. Now, if you would have polled everybody at the Febrengens in those days, and you would have said to them at like, 3 in the morning after the Febrengen had just ended, guys, we're taking a poll. What do you think we could add to the Febrengens that would really just take us to the next level? I promise you, nobody there from the thousands <laughs> of people would say, you know what, let's get a guy with a bucket hat who'd stand on a bench and pump his fist and coach us. Nobody's going to say that. And yet the Debbie's response was, I need a coach. Like, we are lacking. You're the coach. Well, that's what we've been missing. So, you know, there's tolerance, which no one really wants to be tolerated. It's not a compliment mm -hmm. to be tolerated. Tolerance means, okay, you're different, but we, we can, we'll let you be here, even though you're different. And then there's interdependence. Interdependence means you're different. Ah, perfect. Precisely because you are different, we need you. We need that thing that you have that we don't have, that no one else has, that only you have. So yeah. get to work. Yes. We've been waiting for you. We've got to get the show on the road. Exactly. We haven't been able to function properly that, that, till you showed up. That little business-like annoyance that you said, it's because, great, where you been? We where need you. Where have you been? <laughs> Why were you hiding from us? Yeah. And, and that's really the attitude that not only we need to show to others, that's, but let's talk about it for a second, just experience, experiencing that, being on the receiving end, being in the coach's position. We're all busy people today, and we have a lot of things that we need to be doing. We all know what we should be doing, right? We all know we need to get organized, we need to lose some weight, and we need to exercise. At the end of the day, we don't do everything we need to do. We don't do everything. We, I have a lot of things I need to do. But when I know that I'm needed somewhere, there's something really, really compelling. There's something that draws us in deep when we feel that we can be useful, that we have a contribution. And getting back to you know, our, our main conversation, when God speaks to us and he gives us a hint that we may be needed somewhere, yeah. that's a time to be like Abraham and to say, I'm going to set aside whatever I think I know about myself. Man, I wish we had another hour because I really want to go back to the whole discussion of how we develop that false sense of self, usually as children. That was so deep. But, okay, without, getting, <laughs> without unraveling that whole thing, we'll do that on another visit. Okay. But to be willing to set aside and, it, and if necessary, to mourn and to grieve the loss of that, that, that death of false self and to say, you know what? I'm open. I'm receptive. I'm ready to go where I'm needed. even if it doesn't fit the trajectory that I've mapped out for myself. Things work so much better that way. 
Yes. They say, a Mensch tracht und Gott lacht. A person thinks and God laughs. So some, just recently someone was asking me, he says, what's the point of making plans? Because we know it turns out God's way in the end anyway. I told him, I think that's part of it. You have to have plans that get destroyed. You have to make the plan. You have to have your, your, your best thinking. You map it out. This is what makes sense. And then it's simultaneously, a more Gemini uh, paradox for you, to have the humility to say, and after all that planning, I'm totally ready for all of this to be revealed as barking up the wrong tree. Because you might not understand what the right tree is if you didn't put in that work of, of thinking what your tree should be. You have to make the plan because so, you learn about who you are, where you are, what so you're you trying to do. So you end up where you need to be by going to the wrong place. You know, it's the famous story about, uh, I don't know, we're running out of time here, but the famous story about uh, Itzik's shul in Krakow. It's a shul that survived the war. And how was it built? This guy was poor his whole life. How did he build a shul? He donated a shul. His whole life he had a recurring dream that he goes to Prague, a city where he'd never been, and he goes to the palace, which he'd never seen. There were no postcards, right? There were no photos. And he, but every night he, he, he imagines it in his dream. He goes under the moat, and there's a, or the, under the bridge over the moat, and there's a, a spot where he digs and he finds a treasure chest and becomes rich every night in his dream. So Itzik finally, he's getting older. He says, I got I to gotta just check it out. And it's expensive. And he makes the trip, and he, he takes the whole journey. And he gets there, and he sees Prague, and it looks like he always dreamed it was, and the palace, and the moat, and the bridge. And the guard says, what are you doing? He says, I'm going to tell you the truth. Every night of my life, I have a recurring dream. And I just, I had to check it out. And the guard says, you fool. If everyone were as foolish as you, you know where I would be? I have a recurring dream every night of my life. I dream that I'm in Krakow, Poland, a city where I've never been. In Krakow, I'm in the Jewish quarter, where I assure you, I would never step foot. <laughs> and in the Jewish quarter, I'm in a particular house, and he describes the house. And in the house, there's an oven. You move the oven, there's a loose floorboard, and I lift it up, and there's a treasure chest, and I become rich. You don't see me going all the way to Krakow, looking under the floorboards in some Jewish house. Try so Itzik says, I think I forgot something at home. He turns around, and he goes all the way back, and he finds... In his own house. In his own house. So Rabbi Simcha Bonim. He said, somebody once asked him, why do you go to a tzaddik? This is now we're back to back the, where, we, where began. we started. He said, I'll tell you a story. And he told the story of Itzik and Itzik Shul. And he said that sometimes you go out of yourself to find yourself. You go to the tzaddik, not to meet the tzaddik, but to meet yourself. There's a lot more to be said about all this. But I guess where we, re where we began, uh, and it's just a fundamental truth of the world, and particularly of Judaism, and particularly of Hasidic Judaism, and particularly of Chabad Judaism, uh, that we do go to the Sadiq, to, to discover who we are, and that Sadiq still has that power even after his body has left this world. I'll, I'll, tell, you, I'll tell you a story. I hesitate to tell it, but I already said I'm going to tell it. Now what am I going to do? Tell a different one to cover up? <laughs> Only you would know. <laughs> <laughs> no one would ever know. So it's actually, the background of the story is that there, there's, a, there's a passage in the Talmud where uh, a Roman um, aristocrat is saying to one of the sages that, uh, why do you listen to the, the law that was taught by Moses when he's been dead for so many hundreds of years, thousands of years? So he said... There's a three-day Yom Tov coming up. And go see if people, if the Jews keep three-day Yom Tov. You have the, 
the Caesar make a decree that uh, nobody should uh, do work for three days and see what happens. And within half a day, they already caught people breaking it. So the sage said, who is more alive, Moses or, or the Caesar? So the, the story I was going to tell you is I, as a friend of mine, who after, after the Rebbe passed away in 1994, so another chassid, a chassid from a different court, came to a mentor of mine and said to him, when are you going to appoint a, a successor, a new Rebbe? And, and that's a complicated question. So without getting into the whole discussion of you know, succession and everything, but he gave him a different type of an answer. He said to him, why, why do we need to appoint a replacement? He says, because your Rebbe passed away. He says, yeah, he, he passed away, but don't worry, he's still alive. And in fact, I would venture to say he's more, more alive than your Rebbe. So he says, them's fighting words. He says, well, do me a favor. Don't tell me who your Rebbe is because I don't want it to be personal. But let me ask you a question. If your, so this happened in London, England. He said, if your Rebbe told you to move from Stamford Hill to Golders Green, between you and me, your Rebbe would have one less chassid. If your Rebbe, to move from Stamford Hill to Golders Green is from one Orthodox Jewish neighborhood in, in London to another, but across town. But you and I both know that you wouldn't do it and find, you would find a new Rebbe. Mm-hmm. He says, let me tell you something about, about my Rebbe. If a guy, and he said this like a few months after the Rebbe passed away, and yet I think it's still true even more than two decades later, he said, if one of us would find a letter that the postman lost, if the postman lost a letter, and, and, it, and, it, and it, the Rebbe sent you a letter, and it said, move to Antarctica. Not only would you do it, but you'd throw a party and invite all your friends and thank God that you knew what you were supposed to accomplish in life. So my point, what I'm getting at, is when you meet a tzaddik, it's not what can the tzaddik do for you. It's what the tzaddik is going to tell you you can do for the big picture. What does it mean that a tzaddik is alive and that, that this continues after the, the, the physical passing? What it means is that it's a relationship that demands something from you. That if, if you just look at it as a one-way street, you know, and, and there is such a concept of asking for blessings and you're asking you know, and that the, 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 the tzaddik should invoke merit on your behalf, and there's the, the, such a concept. But the real idea is, is, is the opposite, the opposite direction, is that feeling of, of obligation, that feeling of, I'm going to walk into this encounter, and I'm not going to get off scot-free. To the contrary, I know very well I'm going to have this encounter with the Rebbe, just like the dollars. You walk by the Rebbe for a moment, and yeah, the Rebbe would give you a blessing, or the Rebbe would give you encouragement, and yeah, the Rebbe is giving, but also the Rebbe was giving you a mission. <laughs> exactly. He's giving you the dollars, and now tag, you're it. Now you have to go out. Like an officer in the army, you're coming to get your commission. You, so... The, the, it's all, it's an it's a, it's a, it's a interaction. It's always going to put the, the onus on you. It's always going to it's going to always put the work on you. And when you're ready for that, when you're ready to be told what your mission is, and ready to listen without bias, even if what you're told is going to be in conflict with the false sense of self. Mm-hmm. That's what it means, or that's part of discovering your true self, finding out where you're really needed as opposed to your idea of what you thought you needed in life. That, the, 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 the idea of mission, the idea of we need a coach, we need an accidental Talmudist, we need a whatever it is, whatever it is that you do, your thing, and it might not be the thing, see, the coach said, I'm the coach. Good, okay, so be the coach. It's not always so. Sometimes I think I'm one thing, and I find out I'm another. But the, uh, the, 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 having the humility, and humility is teachability, being ready to be told, to be taught who you really are, yeah. 
and what you really need it for. Yeah, everybody wants to be the fighter pilot, but the, the Air Force also needs the mechanic. It also needs the navigator. It also needs the air controller. All these jobs are needed, uh, and it's a blessing if somebody tells us or if we discover through listening to God and the signals that we're given, aha, that's your spot. might not be the spot you thought you wanted. That's right. But that's, that's right. your spot. That's right. So yeah. now go stand your post. And that is teshuva. You know, what does it mean? The new year's coming. Repent. It's not repent. It's return. Return to what? Your true self. There's being your true self, and then there's acting in accordance. There's being and there's doing. Yeah. What does it mean, acting in accordance with your true self? It means having humility to live out the mission that was given to you, even if that's different than the mission that you supposed that you had. Amen. May we all be blessed to discover our mission, to discover ourselves, to go on the journeys that we need to go on so that we can return home with that knowledge. Amen. I want to thank you so much for coming in today, Rabbi Taub. It's, it's, it's an honor and a, and a joy yeah. to learn with you. Let's do another time where we talk about that, that trauma and the false self. We've got to do a whole hour on that. Okay. It's a date. Yeah. It's a date. Thank you. I'm reaching across this wide table so we can shake hands. All the best. All the best. Thank you.